So why does it take, take so long to change the leaves? Well, if we actually go back to 1536, and that's why I'm so pleased that Brooke Wayne is here, because I love honoring our Canadian uh, relatives. It was 1536 that Jacques Cartier from France, as you know, got his ship stuck in the St. Lawrence Seaway outside of Montreal in frozen winter, and they were all dying of scurvy, right? You know the story. And finally, they had been very respectful of the Indians there, the native first generation of people, or the first nation of people. But finally, the, the uh, chief of the tribe, because you could see these men dying on the shipboard, and, and he, they knew, these the natives knew about what to do, and he came and he said, you need to make a tea of the bark of this tree, right? Which they did. It's called the Arbor Vitae tree today. It's the first tree brought from the Americas back to Europe. Arbor Vitae, the tree of life. And in that bark is, um, per 100 grams of bark, is about 45 milligrams of vitamin C. So if you make a tea of the bark, it only takes five milligrams to prevent scurvy, so you're gonna have more than enough to cure scurvy. Now you would say, how long does it take after you drink this tea if your gums are bleeding and your joints are loose and you're, you've got hemorrhages all over your skin? You know, it's a horrible way for these people to die. Tens of thousands of men were dying by this condition. How long does it take after drinking this tea? Sometimes less than a day. Less than a day, their gums start healing. Their hemorrhages start going away. Their joints go in ache. I mean, we're talking about like cortisol or like antibiotics. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So then, you know, from 1536, it's all the way up to 1747 to Lynn. And then it's from 1747 up to Cook, and then from Cook to Vancouver. I mean, we have a lot of years here, right? Like, how, how much light do you need to illuminate the path? That's, that's the question. So then we talk about metabolism. So how long does it take us to understand something about metabolism? Well, I'd like to go back to 1506 with Ulrich Pinder, who is a uh, Dutch a physician of some note in, in the 16th century. And Ulrich Pinder had made observations, I'm not saying he's the only one that done this, and certainly others had, that urine color, smell, and taste had something to do with the metabolism or health of that person. So he developed what was called the urine color wheel. It's the first metabolomic assessment tool that I could ever find in the uh, reported literature. So each of these little vials is, you can't probably see it too well, but it's, it's a color of a urine. And then down here it describes in Dutch exactly what the smell, taste, and physiology, or can they have names, diagnoses basically for these different conditions. Now you remember, um, certainly, uh, their, their examples were with black urine, we're familiar with King George, remember? And what was that disease called? So if you have, it's a defect of, red, of uh, hemoglobin formation. Was it porphyria? Right, porphyria, right? Porphyria, and one of, this, one of the signs of porphyria is mental illness. And in the urine you can see it, right? and you can smell it. Now, the, the diagnosis of diabetes was made up until the 20th century on the basis of taste. Would you love to be a clinical chemist back then? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's sweet urine, right? Sweet urine was the diagnosis for diabetes. So, this, this concept that people differ in the way that they function based upon things that, that are, can be seen, it was a conceptually interesting concept. Then mapping that against things like what effects are in the environment, like what they eat and how they live. How did that influence their metabolism? This is a, a pretty, we take this for granted today. We think, well, yeah, it's obvious. Well, it wasn't obvious for hundreds of years that these were connected. So now we go to the orthomolecular revolution. Here are my founding, in this case, fathers, although I am also going to talk about a mother here in a second. But there are four people that I want to highlight that I think are very important. One who is a Canadian, and one of who is British, and two of who are uh, from the States. So let's start with Sir Archibald Garrod, uh, the father of genetic metabolism, diseases of infancy. Every student who's ever studied physiology has studied Garrod's work in one way or another. Maybe they didn't know that. Uh, but it, when I went back and reread his papers, his first paper published in The Lancet in 1902, if you read that today, you would say this is as modern in, in 2009 as it was written in 1902. This man was totally brilliant. I mean, he was light years ahead of everybody. I don't even know how people probably even 
focused on what he was saying. Because literally, he was talking about molecular groupings from which we sprang some 55 years before DNA was discovered. Right? So I'm going to talk about Archibald Rod for a second. Then I'm going to talk about Roger Williams. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Lance Pauling. And lastly, I'll talk about Edward Hoffer. So Archibald Garan, the individuality of man, individuality of man. He is the person that's credited, at least in the English-speaking literature, as being the person who have first discovered and used the term individuality as it related to metabolism. And so he discovered alkaptonuria, which is, as you know, one of the genetic metabolism diseases of infancy, like Parkinson's disease, megaloblastic anemia, phenylketonuria, Wilson's disease, Gaucher's disease. You're familiar with these, right? These are genetically linked disorders. And so he, from making these discoveries, recognized that there was very vast difference in metabolism from person to person, even though they all had 10 fingers and 10 toes and two eyes and they looked similar, that at the metabolic level, there was very significant difference that you couldn't necessarily see just by looking at their presentation. So here is a reprint of his 1902 paper that uh, appeared in the Lancet, the incidence of alcaptonuria, a case of individual, mechanical individuality. What he says, it has recently been pointed out by Bateson. Now, some of you probably don't know the history of genetics. Remember Gregor Mendel? We all studied him in school. And the monk, the Gregorian monk, that was doing the thump, thump of the peas. Well, can you imagine what the, what the church thought about this concept of genetics when he started showing that there was this dominant recessive characteristic that was passed through, and it was all kind of like you, a math equation. You could make these charts out. I mean, this was like, well, hold on, this is God is making these decisions. This is not like some kind of an arithmetic problem. What's going on here? Because there was a very strong resistance, wasn't there, to science infiltrating those who see the angels and demons. Uh, this is the whole theme of angels and demons, isn't it? This, this kind of uh, interface between science and theology. So uh, Mendel's work was basically block and key put away. And it was just a very small group of number of people knew about it. Then 100 years later, Gregory Bateson, a uh, biologist of great repute, ultimately a Nobel Prize winner, Aris discovered Mendel and really made that accessible. So it was 100 years of kind of quiet about recessives and dominance, and then it reappeared with Bateson and became popular in the, in the 20th century. So he says, if it be correct inference from the available facts that individuals of a species do not conform to an absolutely rigid standard of metabolism, meaning all of us are not the same, but differ slightly in their chemistry as they do in their structure, it is no more surprising that they should occasionally exhibit conspicuous deviations from the specific type of metabolism that is considered normal. Now that's a profound sentence. I don't know if that hits you like it hits me. I mean, I know I'm a chemist, so I, I tend to be inclined toward that kind of language. But what he's basically saying is we differ remarkably in our chemistries, even though we might be considered normal people, right? Normal, but what does normal mean? Is it normal the same or normal within a galaxy and curve of distributions? So then uh, the summary of this work, this was uh, General Parent uh, Disabilities, it published a few years ago, says uh, his second book, Inborn Factors in Disease, was about inherited predisposition to disease, chemical and metabolic individuality, which are the modalities of predisposition originated in the molecular groupings in Gerard's view of life. Such groupings as the inner locus molecular hybrids, the lily complementation and expression of modifier genes can assume varying expression in the heterozygotes. Now what's that mean? What that means to me, if to make this language simple, is that yes, our genes are there as templates for what we might be, but they don't tell us what we are. What tells us what we are is how our genes interact with our environment from the moment the sperm beats the egg. The environment is the modifier for the expression of our genetic pluripotentiality into who we will become, emotionally, physically, physiologically. So our genes are a potential, but not an outcome. You follow what I'm saying? And the variation can be that of our environment that causes them to modify their expression.